All right, uh, how's my sound? Are you all good? Can you hear me? I, I am uh, James Wexler. I'm from, uh, from Google, from the pair team at Google, uh, People Plus AI Research Team. Uh, and this is Andrew Zaldivar. We'll be talking about probing machine learning models using the What If tool and SHAP. Um, we'll get into everything that that means. Um, this is going to be a hands on tutorial. So we'll spend the first, well, we'll see how long the slides take, but 30 minutes or so discussing things, giving a demo. Um, and then in the last hour, um, anyone with a laptop um, can join in and we'll be doing an exercise together, letting you kind of break out and discuss things and play with the tools and, and see what you can find on our data set and models. Um, so to get to that notebook, um, in order to, to jump in for the hands-on part, um, this bottom link is where you want to go, which is all the tutorial information. So paircode.github.io slash whatiftool slash fat2020. Um, so I'll give you guys a chance to, uh, to head there right now before I click off the slide, but I'll, I'll go back to the URL uh, later as well. All right, uh, to give an introduction into the pair team and what we do, um, we're a multidisciplinary cross-functional team at Google um, who centers on making, um, doing human-centered research and design um, to make the human AI partnership more productive, enjoyable, and fair. Uh, what that means in practice is making tools and open sourcing tools and research um, to help um, both that uh, technical society, people making ML models and deploying them, and also end users to gain insight into um, machine learning models, their internals, and fairness and transparency about them. Um, so we've created a wide variety of tools so far in our uh, two or so year existence. Um, things like the What If tool, which we'll be demoing now. Um, also um, an embedding projector, which is part of TensorBoard. Um, some blogs and articles that we put out on a pair medium channel along with on some Google blogs. Um, and other interactive uh, articles. Um, and now Andrew's gonna go ahead and explain um, basically how ML explainability exists and where it's, uh, where it's centered in this whole you know, uh, giant ecosystem. Uh, thank you, James, and uh, thank you all for uh, deciding to come join our tutorial. I know many of you have traveled from, I don't know, parts unknown, uh, just to, uh, uh, well, among many other uh, interesting sessions and talks and, and tutorials to actually uh, sit here with us and uh, get some uh, deeper insight into what this What If tool is all about. And uh, maybe it'll be something that, uh, that you'd be interested in using for whatever sort of um, fairness or anything related to machine learning development. Um, also, I should uh, mention that while I am not uh, officially on the PEAR team, I'm sort of considered like a friend and family of PEAR. Uh, I'm actually on the Ethical AI Research Group, and I serve as their senior developer advocate, helping communities build uh, socially responsible AI systems. And so the Wotif tool has been very instrumental in helping us engage with the uh, larger community, um, not just practitioners, but other types of stakeholders from policymakers, nonprofits, uh, even uh, high school students that want to um, learn how to build responsible AI systems. And so, uh, in, and I'm also sort of serving as like the hype man here, uh, and we'll be fielding any questions as the tutorial uh, goes into full swing here. So, um, preface aside, uh, let me begin by sort of asking a question about explainability, more specifically about how explainability fits into the machine learning life cycle. And uh, I realize that as I am asking this question, uh, I'm sure many of you already have well thought out, uh, articulated, um, deep, deeply researched answers to these questions. And so I'll try my best to sort of um, encapsulate that in a few slides or less. So forgive me if I get some of this, um, this generalization wrong, but uh, bear with us here as you know, we are uh, pressed for time. And, um, and by the way, this machine learning life cycle, there are many different takes and perspectives on this. This is something that you see uh, throughout a lot of production machine learning systems uh, from whether it's a product, whether it's something that a corporate's using, or whether it's uh, an individual contributor that's trying to release something in open source. Um, the process is pretty consistent um, insofar as you know, you're starting off with, and by the way, I'm speaking um, uh, 
talking about uh, supervised learning in particular, I mean, there are many other types of machine learning life, cycle, life cycles depending on, you know, the type of classifier that you're using. And, and then just more broadly AI, right? There's a lot of different approaches to it. But if you're doing some supervised learning system that is dependent on data as input, uh, naturally the first step would be to gather and pre-process that data. And so um, when it comes to explainability, explainability at that point, you may want to start to identify any sort of imbalances that you may have in your data set that could lead to uh, astray outcomes. Um, and then, you know, as you're building, training, fitting your model, and then evaluating that, uh, you want to ensure that, you know, even at that stage, way before you've even considered deploying and, and productionizing and enveloping that model into something that society at large will interact with, you'll want to ensure that you're treating all of these groups fairly. Whatever groups are, 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 are featured in the model and that you're, um, and you're trying to best serve use, are through this model. And so naturally, you're also setting these prediction thresholds. Again, in supervised learning, uh, when you're doing this classification, you have to decide on what these thresholds are and that you may or may not have some trade-offs and it's important to consider that. And part of the explainability effort is uh, in understanding what sort of what these predictions uh, threshold will result. And then, you know, as that model is deployed, you'll want to have a better understanding of how your model will behave on real data because, you know, at the end of the day, your training, your test eval, that's just a snapshot of the past. And now you're trying to use that model to make predictions. I'm, I'm, I know you all know this already, um, but, uh, but it's important to sort of uh, emphasize this point here, because a lot of this was part of the inspiration behind the what-if tool. Um, and then lastly, you know, as you're making predictions, you're trying to figure out best ways of surfacing that information to uh, end users, impacted individuals, um, so that they can also make more informed decisions about whether or not this is a product or a service or a feature that they should utilize. Uh, and I should also mention that this process is not linear. I, we only use that linear uh, visualization just to sort of um, illustrate one point, but uh, in actuality, it's an iterative on, uh, ongoing process. And you know, again, all of you know that already. But then another question begs to, my, uh, begs to ask is how these biases could be introduced into machine learning life cycles. And in this particular case here, I'm just talking about bias in the normative sense. I'm not talking about uh, any sort of uh, bias necessarily that's tied to like discrimination or what have you, though th those sort of situations can arise, and I'll get to that in just a moment, but just in the normative sense, like how, how is your model, how can your model, how can your data be skewed? Um, and again, along this process, there are many ways in which these biases can int could be introduced, whether it's from the developers, the stakeholders, whomever is involved in building the process, there are ways in which biases can be introduced from how and why the data sources were selected, um, how the model will be operationalized as far as like you're choosing these thresholds, uh, and lastly, how, uh, how the model is um, designed. You know, all of that, all of this decision making, you know, on the subject of accountability, comes from those that are involved in that decision making process. But you also have sources of biases that just exist uh, in the real world itself just by happenstance because of who we are as humans, right? Um, and you know, sometimes it could be due to the fact that the data that is collected uh, is not the actual ground truth, right? Maybe it's a reference to the ground truth, but due to whatever reason, maybe the instruments that are used to gather that data uh, uh, can only go so far. And so the best that we can do is make these inferences or references to that ground truth. And, and that could altercate things and that could introduce certain biases. Um, as well as sort of judging these outcomes that come out of these models and how sometimes they can incidentally, um, they're, they could be incidental rather than uh, uh, causally meaningful. And then lastly, how these models can be blind to broader societal issues, whether or not you've even fully scoped out all of these scenarios, you may never know because there could always be blind spots. Um, and like 
the ML lifecycle process as well as the explainability process being an iterative ongoing cycle, so too are these biases being reinforced through this feedback loop. And uh, it's through these biases where you may at times encounter something that is unintended and as a result could arise unfair applications of machine learning. And so examples of this, again, I'm sure a lot of you are already familiar with this context, but, um, and this is terminology that was adapted from Kay Crawford uh, at her keynote in NeurIPS a few years back. Um, but some of these applications of unfairness could be sort of uh, consolidated into uh, examples such as representational harm, which sort of uh, gets at sort of the negative stereotypes that may be amplified due to machine learning systems um, being trained on this unintended biased data set. You also have opportunity denial or allocative harm where uh, impacted individuals may not have access to certain opportunities, resources, and overall their quality of life may be diminished because these algorithms are systemically uh, uh, against, um, against selecting these individuals for favorable, desirable outcomes. And then the last uh, disproportionate failure um, where in cases where it's not related to representational harm or opportunity denial, you still have these systemic outcomes that uh, disproportionately fail for a particular group. And I think uh, it's, it's reasonable to say that PAIR and the what if tool, all of this, uh, again, I'm not on PAIR, but I work very closely with PAIR. Uh, a lot of that work um, speaks to uh, our our ability or rather just our motivation to put our AI principles into practice and particularly um, our principle around unfair biases and ensuring that we, we do our best to try and avoid uh, creating or reinforcing these biases. But sometimes there can be challenges there in the sense that like there might not be necessarily, there not, not, might, not might be tooling or resources to surface some of these problems until they happen. And obviously we don't want to uh, go further down that route. We rather try and, um, and intervene as early as possible proactively without actually impacting an individual's life. And it's a, it's a very tall order, but something that was used as inspiration behind uh, the what if tool and many of pairs other uh, uh, projects. And uh, I, we recognize that there are many different ways uh, to interpret models and data sets, uh, so many that we can't fully capture all of them in today's tutorial. Um, but for the, uh, for the purposes of this tutorial, we'll hone in specifically on SHAP, which James will talk about later in this presentation and we'll show you how that can be plugged into the what if tool so that you can use this rich interactive visualization to uh, sort of understand exactly how your model is behaving and start asking questions about how your model could behave or misbehave depending on certain contexts. All right, and I'm gonna pass it off to James who will now start talking about the what if tool. All right, thanks Andrew. Um, yeah, so as mentioned, um, the what if tool fits into part of this ML lifecycle where we wanna look at um, a data set and the biases that may exist in it and then a trained model uh, that's been trained on that or a similar data set to see how that model is behaving on a data set. Um, we consider it, I guess we, what we like to call it as a probe for a, an already trained classification or regression model um, to kind of start asking these human-centered questions about how a model is behaving uh, historically um, when teams in the past would create models um, to deploy into the real world, oftentimes what they're looking at before they you know, flip the switch to move to a new model is looking at things like accuracy or a precision recall curve or their loss, area under the curve, these kind of static metrics about how a model is performing on a specific data set, which give you a good overall idea of what's happening at the, at the broadest level in terms of a data set on a specific model, but doesn't answer more specific questions that uh, one might ask, like how might my model perform on a specific subgroup uh, of data. Um, if these are humans, we, we can think of those subgroups as, as um, you know, different facets, um, you know, like slicing based on age or based on uh, race or gender. Um, how does my perform, model perform on those subgroups? How about on, uh, on cross, cross slices of that test data? So 
not just by fasting by a single attribute, but by looking at intersectional groups, um, because a lot of fairness research out there has shown that just stratifying things across one dimension is not often uh, enough to really show the real, uh, the real harms that can come from using some of these systems. Um, other questions someone might want to ask is, I have a data point, a model made a decision on it, you know, a yes or no decision. Um, what if I change something about that data point, the smallest amount, is that going to change the yes to a no? Um, what different things can I change to, to, to make that yes turn into a no? Um, what happens if I play with that threshold we were talking about on a, on a classification model to make it a, a little more strict um, or a little more lenient? How is that going to change my behavior across different sets of people? So these are questions that are a little more human focused than general, than just like what's my accuracy or what's my area under the curve? And that's, um, that's why we built the what if tool to kind of ask and answer those questions um, across a wide variety of classification and regression models um, with minimal code. Because um, what I saw when I was starting to work on, on tools in this area is that um, for a specific model, especially at large companies, um, the research scientists will build a lot of uh, excellent but very specific code to ask and answer these questions, um, purely like in Python and maybe a Jupyter or a Colab notebook, um, which works well for their specific model in their case on their data, but doesn't generalize to the next project that needs to ask and answer the same questions. So a lot of what the what-if tool was built to be is, is a general purpose solution to, to ask and answer those questions on a wide variety of models so that anyone in the world who has uh, a classification or regression model can start doing this work without having to write that you know, collab notebook that's 500 lines long that's just for their use case. Um, so this is a, a peek at what it looks like. Um, the basic layout here, and I'll dive into a, a live demo after going over some of the features, is that we have a plot of all the test data points we're looking at that we want to um, explore. You can select any of them and see what the um, different values are for that data point and what the model or models thought in terms of making a prediction. Um, and there's a wide variety of other features that we'll get into. Um, so let's dive in. So the first thing it does is support what-if analysis. Um, so what that often means is, is asking hypotheticals about a specific data point. And again, this is something that's not mind-blowing in terms of what you should be doing with your models, but there aren't a lot of tools out there that could easily make you, allow you to do this in a free and open source way. So take a data point, click on a, 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 you know, a specific value like someone's age or capital gains uh, and, and change it and see what happens to the model. Um, so just being able to, to visually do that um, can be something that's really powerful. Um, and it kind of expands the, the scope of who can ask these questions from ML researchers and software developers to uh, a wide variety of people, uh, other non-technical people that are uh, stakeholders, such as product managers and, and directors, but also um, hopefully at the, at the end of the day, end users as well, you know, just observers. Um, beyond just simple, I'm changing, you know, someone's age and I want to see what happens, um, we can ask a more technical version of that um, through counterfactuals. And I'm using the, the Walker definition here of, of counterfactuals, um, which is like, I have a model that's determining loans um, and this person was denied a loan. And I want to ask the question, you know, what would have to change for that person to have gotten a loan? Um, and there's a few different ways to approach that question, um, as mentioned here. One is, you know, use an optimization problem to, to tweak all the different parameters to find the smallest set of tweaks to get to a hypothetical person that got the loan that's very similar to the one that didn't get the loan. Um, another a way to approach that is to set, load a, a corpus of real people that have been running this model and look for the most similar person to the one that was denied a loan and see what was different between, um, between those two people. Now, those are both really good ways to go about this work. The what if tool uses the second approach um, because it's a front end tool that, that runs live in the browser that, that works on a subset of your data. Um, and it's a really interesting way to probe models um, that brings kind of this really excellent research into a visual tool kind of at the click of a button. Um, so that's what we're seeing here um, is that, um, you know, here like selecting a data point, clicking a slider, and now seeing the difference between a specific data point and the counterfactual one. Um, and um, one thing we really wanted to, um, to enable that wasn't enabled when we first released the tool, because the tool was released in late 2017 and has been in active development since then, is the idea that this should be something we can use not just with one model, but if we want to compare two models. And that's where a lot of real-world usage comes in, because oftentimes you have a model that's been deployed, and then you've trained a new model, either on the same data that uses a different optimization or uses a different technique, or maybe your data has changed, and now you're training a new model on, on more up-to-date data. You want to understand how those models differ beyond just accuracy. Um, so this is an approach to that by, by being able to put two models in the same system and, and ask the same question of both models at the same time. Um, and and uh, another big feature of the tool is just allowing you to create custom visualizations and not being prescriptive about how you want to look at your data. So if you wanted to create a, you know, a scatter plot by two of your features and color by the prediction strength, or if you wanted to create you know, a two-dimensional histogram um, and then have those be labeled by, by a third value, um, 
oftentimes we found that the right visualization for analyzing a model is very specific to the data and the model. So we made it to be as, as um, customizable as possible in that way in terms of how you want to look at your data. Um, at the cost, I suppose, of some automation. So there are other great, um, this is just one of many great tools to kind of do this type of work. Um, and this allows a little more flexibility, but also gives a little more freedom to have to discover those options versus something that's more prescriptive about showing you exactly what you should be looking at. I can do that. <laughs> Thank you. Um, oh, yeah, and there's a question too. Can you explore? Oh, sorry. My question was about the front end mm -hmm. because you said that you could choose or find the point that was closest in the data set, right? But the difference between doing solving the optimization problem is that you get the right, the correct minimum, right? Mm -hmm. But just in the front end, you just get the closest in the data set, which not necessarily are the same. Right, yeah. In the, the implementation that the what-if tool uses, we find the closest point that exists in the data set you've loaded, not the theoretical minimal counterfactual. And the second question was, uh, let's say that I, I found an analysis that I like and I want to share it. Can you export this like a, a URL that someone else can also access to it and that's, share the results? That's or? a great question because that is a often asked feature and one that wasn't yet implemented when we released it and now is kind of a top of mind for us. Okay. Um, so right now, the way people are sharing out results with the what-if tool is mainly through screenshots, which is not ideal. So you see a lot of people using it, taking a screenshot, putting it into a slide deck. Um, as you mentioned, yeah. that's not perfect. We do have, um, there's a few different ways to use the what-if tool. Um, one is in a notebook environment like we'll be doing hands-on in this tutorial. Another is as part of the TensorBoard um, front-end platform for TensorFlow. Um, and when using it in TensorBoard, we do have some URL parameters that allow you to kind of specify what state you're in. So you can share that URL and someone else will kind of be brought to the same state. But it's not full in that it doesn't include like which point was selected and if you're looking at a counterfactual. So those are things where we actively want to add, um, but unfortunately are not there yet. But uh, we hear you and think that's a good idea. Thank you. In fact, we're, uh, as we, as we um, go on to build new tools, um, new versions of the what-if tool, and also future tools that do similar things, but maybe for different types of models or expand on this work. Um, that's always now like a priority one feature um, that from now on we want to kind of build in the ability to share this out um, without just taking screenshots, because it's not ideal. Um, another thing we have is, is user-focused customizations that's been added more recently, um, where um, even with uh, the flexible framework of, of the what-if tool, there are a lot of models that don't quite fit what we're asking people to provide when you're using the tool. Um, so we allow through Python functions the ability to create your own prediction um, function. Um, so for example, if, you were, um, you know, if you're not using TensorFlow, um, the what-if tool still works if you're using a PyTorch model or a XGBoost model or anything else. All you have to do is write the Python code to, that takes an input, um, you know, a list of your examples as an array, and outputs prediction scores. And that way we kind of handle uh, any model that you can access through Python. And that, that Python code could also like, make a call out to, uh, you know, to, to a remote server if, if your model is being served somewhere else. Um, we also allow customization of distance metrics. So as, as we talked about with counterfactuals, you're able to um, say what's the closest point where the decision was made differently. Um, what closest means, I kind of skipped over that. Um, in tabular data, um, such as the examples we're going to be playing with, it can be pretty easy to calculate on our own, you know, for numeric features, we can just look at means and standard deviations to find out how different someone's age is from someone else's age. And for categorical features like, um, like race or, or gender, we can look at um, basically the, the entropy of that to see, you know, the odds of two randomly sampled people having the same, same race in the data set to understand the distance between two data points that are different races. And we can use that to find closest examples. Um, but in a much more complicated model that uses maybe text or uses images, the, the concept of closeness um, is pretty nebulous. And so we allow you to define that however you want to define that. And we have some examples of the what-if tool uh, for images and text that take advantage of that to define closeness in ways that people might find meaningful to look for counterfactuals. Um, beyond just that simple single example probing, um, we also visualize model performance. So um, instead of just looking at a single data point, you might ask yourself, how's the model performing across my entire set of 1,000 or 10,000 know, test data points? Um, so we can look at things like confusion matrices and accuracy uh, across the entire data set. We could then also um, slice that data set um, by any of our features and say, well, how is my performance um, on, on, in this data set, male versus female? 
um, and, and also do intersectional analysis, as I mentioned before, on, on more than one feature uh, to start to ask those questions about if we're having you know, harm in certain groups but not others. Um, and that leads into the, to the next feature here, which is um, ML fairness optimizations. Um, basically, if, if you've split out your data set into, into groups, in this case, um, male and female um, from this UCI census data set, um, you might want to ask yourself, um, is my model treating those two groups unfairly? And as I think a, a lot of people here at FatStar know, unfairly is, is a very loaded word. There's a lot of ways to define fairness uh, in technical machine learning um, that just get to the guts of what a model is doing. Um, things such as demographic parity, equal opportunity, um, and, and so on. So we've um, added some controls into the visualization to ask those questions. You know, if I wanted demographic parity between group one and group two, how would I have to set the, the, op the prediction thresholds for, for males versus females to achieve that? And what would that do to my other metrics? So we, we translated some of that research into, into single button clicks, which can be really valuable for, for uh, less technical folks that, that need to understand the fairness of these models, which is the majority of the stakeholders using these models are, are not technical folks. Um, as mentioned before, the tool is open source. Um, what if tool hyphen, uh, what if hyphen tool dev gets us to our homepage where you can get a link to the code and documentations and tutorials and demos. Um, and it's super easy to use um, inside of a notebook. You just pip install wit widget. Um, so wit is what if tool shortened and, and widget since we're a widget inside of a larger notebook. Um, now I'm gonna dive into a, um, a small demo of using it live on one of our demo data sets. And then we'll talk a bit about um, feature importance in SHAP. And then we'll dive into our exercise where we're gonna use both together. All right, so here I've, um, this is one of the demos that exists on the What If Tool website. Um, to frame this, this is, um, what we're doing here is um, we're probing binary classifiers um, on the UCI census data set. So is anyone here familiar with that data set already? Okay, very little. Um, the idea behind this data set is that um, each data point is a person um, from US census data back from the 90s. So this is a long time ago um, and a small subset of that data. Um, so each point includes things like age, um, race, occupation, um, capital gains and capital losses reported on their taxes, and what um, the task of this data set is to predict whether this person from their census data earns more or less than $50,000 back in the 90s. So that's high income or low income. And this is a popular data set for ML fairness investigations because it contains protected properties, which are interesting to, to dive into in terms of uh, fairness across those properties. Um, and it's also a nice open source data set. So it's, it's been used in a lot of uh, fairness research. Although, as, you, as we'll see now, it's not very representational and it has a lot of um, significant downsides, which is why it makes for a pretty compelling demo for the tool. In this version of the demo, we're comparing two classifiers that have been already trained. Um, one is a simple um, linear classifier that, that just combines the different features um, with different coefficients and outputs uh, a score, um, a probability of how likely you are to be high income. The other model is a more of a deep neural network that has a, um, basically has a bunch, bunch more guts in the middle and can be a little um, less scrutable. And we want to compare the two to see uh, how they perform against each other and what issues they might have. Um, so the initial view you dropped into is all 500 of our test data points. And because we're comparing two models, what we see is, is, a, is a graph here of um, basically how likely the person is to be high income from model one on the x-axis here and how likely model two thinks that they are high income. Um, so anything in the top right here is a data point that both models consider uh, very likely to be high income. See here we see model one with a very high score of 0.994 out of one, and model two with a score of 0.903 out of one. And we see um, this person's information here on the left-hand side. So there are 44, they have uh, 99,999 capital gains. That's an oddly specific number, um, but we'll see why. Um, and here's the rest of their information. Um, so um, because of this default visualization, one of the nice things we can look at is Immediately, we see that anything that's off this diagonal axis is where the two models disagree the most about a single point. So it's really easy to quickly find points where something's changed to this specific person because we switched from model one to model two. So let's click on one of those that's kind of the most off axis. Um, there's a bunch we can choose from. Let's see, um, if I wanna try this one. Um, so now we've clicked on this point, we can see that model zero, or sorry, model one, um, which is the deep model here, um, thinks that this person is low income um, with a probability of 0.72, and model one thinks that they are high income with a probability of, of 0.62, so a pretty big divergence between the two. Um, so this, the, as, as mentioned before, one of the simplest things we can do is, is ask the model, 
uh, the first model to show us what's the most similar data point where you would have predicted high income instead of low income. And we can see what difference um, that entails. In this case, a lower age um, and a lower capital gains um, and, and different education. Um, so this point has a lot of differences between the two. And we can click around to see um, basically what that means across points. So here's one where the, the deep model predicted low income with a pretty high probability and the, the closest counterfactual um, was predicted as high income. Um, the difference is here is that this person's a little younger, um, works a little less per week. Um, everything else is identical, except their capital gains is zero. Um, and to me, this, when this first popped out of me using the tool, this is really counterintuitive. Because uh, off the top of my head, I would think the more capital gains you're reporting on your taxes, the more likely you are to have more money. Uh, I think that's a, what most people would think off the top of their heads. Um, but that's not what this model is saying in terms of what it's learned. Um, so we can pop over here to look at another view of this, a partial dependence plot, um, which is basically saying for this data point, let's keep everything about them identical, but only change one feature at a time from the minimum to the maximum and see how the prediction scores change. We can see that as, as age goes up, uh, the blue model, which is our deep model, becomes a little more likely to, to say that you're high income for this data point, and so does the orange model, but not enough to flip a, flip a uh, prediction. Whereas um, with the capital gains, we see that the deep model's in this weird divot um, where if you lower this person's capital gains, the model will be more likely to think that they're high income. If you raise their capital gains, the model's more likely to think that they're high income. They're just in this really weird individual like, valley um, that you wouldn't expect as a, a normal person just deploying this model. Um, so that leads to a lot of questions. You know, why? And, and also, is this desired? Um, you know, it could be the case that uh, as someone who's deploying a model to the real world, this is something in the data set that I want to reflect in the model's decision. Or it could be the case that this is a strange anomaly and you'd never want to release this to the public. All these kind of decisions kind of have to be framed in terms of what the model is being used for. Um, but um, if we pop over to our features tab, what we're gonna see here is like a statistical breakdown of all of our test data points feature by feature to see uh, what it looks like. These are the distributions of ages in our 500 test points um, with a, you know, a mean of 37, um, but a max of 80 and, and a minimum of 17. And here's capital gains. Uh, which looks super weird. Um, I only see one bar here. I, in fact, I have to switch to a log scale to even see what the other bars are. And uh, I can also sort this by non-uniformity to see which features are the most non-uniform. Um, and capital gains is the most non-uniform numeric feature here. Um, so what this is saying is that 90% of the values in this data set are zero for capital gains. Only 10% have a value that's non-zero. Um, and that leads me to believe as, as a model developer that, that what's probably happened in this case, since the linear model has, has a nice increasing slope for capital gains, whereas the deep model has this interesting divot, which actually persists across data points, not just for the one I showed, um, that the deep model has enough capacity to learn that um, very little capital gains would mean low income on average, very high capital gains would mean high income on average, but zero capital gains has no information because most data points actually have zero capital gains, which could be a result of just how the tax code works and um, how people are likely to report taxes. So even a lot of the high income um, people in this data set might have zero capital gains reported, but that, that doesn't necessarily mean that that's what the world is like. Um, and that's something the deep model has learned that the linear model could not learn because it doesn't have the capacity for that interesting divot relationship. Um, so this is the kind of thing that the what-if tool is kind of built to find out um, without having to write any code. Um, we can also, oh, yes, question. Let's use the mic. Just to clarify some assumptions here, um, mm -hmm. both models are trained in the same uh, splits of the data set, right? Yep. And, uh, mm, and I'm forgetting my second question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we actually have um, a collab version of this exact demo where you, the, the models get trained right in the um, notebook and then get displayed. So the, the results will be a little different because it's a, you know, your own training of the model, but you can see the similar thing happening on the downloading the data set, training the two models in TensorFlow and using the tool right in one notebook. Right. I was going to ask, what's the limit of the data points you can yep. have at the same time on this, just to make sure you have the whole data set or, no, or not? You should just keep asking questions, because they're all, they're all questions I want to answer, so keep, keep thinking of those. Um, the, the limit is actually dependent on your data set, um, because this tool runs entirely in the browser, um, so that it can be completely interactive um, and live, as opposed to a tool where you might have to run a back end for an hour to get results, and then load them up and not have interactivity. So that means that um, we're limited by the amount of memory that the browser has to load these examples um, and run them live. So what that means in practice is for simple tabular data like this, you can load tens of thousands of points in the what-if tool and use it live, and it, it has no lag or, or browser issues. 
if your images, uh, if your input data is images or giant paragraphs of text, um, that number shrinks down. Um, so for example, with images, it might be something more like 500 at a time that could work with the tool. Whereas with tabular data, um, and I think in the, the notebook we're gonna jump into, you can use it on all 10,000 points at the same time and have no problem. So James, on the topic of interactivity, um, and seeing as how uh, awesome questions are being raised, uh, maybe we can give uh, the other side of the room an opportunity to ask one yes. question and then before we move on to the next slide. I don't know if this mic is working, but um, I think it's working. If there's a green light. Yeah, sounds right. Hi, thanks. Um, I was wondering if there are any privacy measures in place for uh, people, like I can imagine a company that wants to use this and has their own model and their own data set that yep. they don't necessarily want. Yep. Uh, yeah. yeah, that's a good question. So the, the use of the, um, the tool, the tool itself has nothing built in in terms of privacy protection. So it's about deploying the tool in a privacy preserving area. So um, we have our web demo where it's like the model and the data is completely fixed. We have um, the ability to use it in, um, in Colab, which is a hosted service. So that, that might not be a place to, to, to use um, you know, private data sets and models. But then it's also installable in your own Jupyter environments um, or in your own local environments through TensorBoard. Um, and TensorBoard has privacy preserving where you can um, you know, restrict who's going to that endpoint. Um, so it's about deploying it in the right place, but the tool itself is, is kind of open. Um, right, so jumping back into the performance and fairness, um, this, this is the, the tab that gives you the overall set on my 500 data points. How's, my, how's model one and model two doing? Both pretty accurate, 85%. And we can look at their confusion matrices to see if they're making more false positives or false negatives. Um, and we could also just kind of scrub things around and say, oh, let's make the deep model uh, way more strict about who it says is high income. It, that has to be... 0.84 confidence before it says yes to high income. And we can see what that does in terms of um, you know, eliminating false positives, um, but at the, at the cost of higher false negatives. Um, the more interesting question to ask might be, what's the optimum threshold, given these 500 data points, to set the threshold at to be the most accurate? And we can ask that with you know, a simple button press and see that the answer is, uh, is 0.4 for our deep model and 0.64 for our, our, uh, our linear model. Um, but then in terms of fairness, we can do something like fastening by, in this case, this data set has sex as male and female. We can, um, we can fasten all of our data points. We see have 339 male to 161 female. That's already an interesting statistic right there because we see a pretty huge imbalance in the, the, the representation here, which should be closer to 50-50 here, but is, is not. It's more like 66 to 33. Um, and we look at how the two models are performing. Um, this uh, deep model, um, it says that men are high income about 28% of the time and women 9.3% of the time, so a gigantic disparity there. Um, we can also look at the true distribution of the data uh, here in this column. We see that from the actual data we're, we've been testing on, um, men are labeled as high income 28% of the time versus 11% of the time for female. So some of this imbalance is coming from the data we've trained on. Uh, that being said, the data we've trained on is from 1990s in a specific county in California, and is not representative of um, the large United States, or the real world, or modern times. So that's one thing to be careful whenever training models on, on, on data, especially human-centered data. Um, and now that we've, oh, one question, yep. Does the, pool, uh, the tool at any point have kind of uh, something to make you aware that maybe your data set is being too small, like when you have very, very small sample sizes in, in certain features, like you're, mm -hmm. you keep selecting stuff and you don't notice how you go down the statistical scale? Yep. Yeah, that's a good question, and that's something that the tool doesn't have right now. One nice thing we've done in the past few months is partnered with a, another tool, another open source tool that's been put out by Google called um, um, Fairness Indicators from the TensorFlow model analysis team, um, where it does, um, as we were mentioning with larger data sets, it can do this kind of analysis offline. Um, so run through your entire data set and do this type of fairness analysis, and at the end print out more static displays about that, and that does a better job of kind of labeling things that might be problematic off the bat. With the tool here, we're not doing the auto-labeling of that, um, which is, I, I suppose, a, a, a deficiency there. But um, one nice thing is we've, we've integrated the two tools so you can use the fairness indicators, find a problematic slice, and click on it. And then the what-if tool will then update with points from that specific slice so that we kind of gain some of the uh, insights that that team is giving uh, into the tool itself. So, so maybe one more question and then move no, on to on. the next okay. slide. Okay. There'll be more opportunity for discussion. In your experience from users, um, how do you have the thing that now that you've provided with all these possibilities 
<laughs> to the user, then the user gets the cognitive overload or of, okay, what do I do with all this complexity? Mm -hmm. What researchers have not figured out, now it's on the face of the user and what is fairness? What do I do with my model? Is this good or bad? I don't know. What's, what's your experience with the users? Yeah, um, that's interesting to bring it up now because we just finished doing some uh, internal user studies at Google and external user studies. Uh, people outside of Google that have used the tool and did some um, UX research on them and interview sessions. And um, one thing we found is that um, although we built the tool with kind of the broad spectrum of users in mind, um, it's become, because we wanted to jam so many interesting you know, research insights into it, it's become a little more complicated than I think initially desired. So it's actually uh, much more usable and valuable right now to the research community, like uh, ML researchers and software developers that are deploying these models and PMs that work in it, than those that are just interested in probing a model they've heard about for fairness. So that is something that we're, we're thinking about because um, one flavor of that might be um, you know, building a simplified version that has less controls but is a little more um, deliberate in what it shows to make it uh, easier to use and, and less cognitive overload. Um, but we haven't gotten to that stage yet, but it is something we've heard and uh, probably deserves a little bit of, of thought about how to build an interactive tool about machine learning fairness that doesn't kind of give cognitive overload when we try to um, uh, you know, uh, explain all these features and fairness values that are pretty complex and uh, trying to distill them down to a few buttons and explainer you know, pop-ups. Speaking of complex and buttons, um, probably the most complex buttons <laughs> are then uh, if we facet our data set, in, in this case by sex, asking questions about fairness. So saying, well, what if we wanted demographic parity in this model between men and women so that the model predicted, yes, the same percentage of time for men and women? How would you have to adjust your thresholds post-training to make that happen? So we can click a button and let it calculate. And what we're going to find out, uh, not surprising, is that you have to make the, the male model uh, much more strict and, and dial down the, um, the strictness of the female model to get about 10% yes for both groups. Now what that's going to do is obviously um, raise the number of false negatives for men and, and false positives for female because there's obviously an, an, uh, there has to be a trade-off between um, between um, you know, democratic parity version of fairness and other metrics, unless your model has the um, same exact rate of yes in the ground truth data, which as we've seen is not true at all in this data set. Um, and then we could ask the same question, but using equal opportunity, um, which is a different measure of fairness, um, which we have a little definer for here, which is saying that out of all those people in the ground truth that have been labeled as high income, we want a similar percentage of those to be predicted as high income for both men and women. So a bit more complicated um, in terms of the definition of what you mean there, but in some sense, depending on the, the platform you're deploying to and what the model is, maybe um, a more desirable version of fairness. And we can see what that does to the model. It, it actually lowers the male threshold back down a little bit. Um, all right, um, running a bit behind, so we'll jump on to, um, back into uh, a little bit of a primer into what Shapley values are um, and feature importance, and then dive into you all being able to play with a, a notebook version of this on a different data set. Um, so feature attribution is um, basically giving an amount to each feature that a model uh, has predicted something on to say how, how much contribution did this specific feature have. Um, so in this case, we're saying that on some low-end prediction model, that income you know, accounted for 0.6 out of the 0.8 you know, probability that you can get a loan, and age accounted for 0.3, and then your credit score brought it down another 0.1, and that adds up to this 80% likely to be approved. That's what feature attribution is in a nutshell, and there's um, a ton of ways to calculate that. Um, one specific way um, is with Shapley values in the Shap open source library, uh, which we didn't develop, but we like to make use of because it's um, a great and easy way to get feature importance values that have some theoretical guarantees um, in a simple Python package. Um, so it's an open source framework for doing exactly this that has some built-in visualizations of their own. Um, the idea behind Shap is uh, it's, it uses like, this game theoretic approach to um, basically figuring out the the, the, margin, the marginal like, um, effect of adding in a specific value, like your age is this, or removing your age is this from a data point and seeing how that affects the model's prediction. So it returns you know, instance level feature attributions for this specific example, how important was age versus, versus sex versus capital gains. Um, and it works not on tabular data only, but also on images and texts and with many different frameworks. It's a really flexible library. Um, um, here's a bit of math that I'm not going to go into, um, but basically it's saying the weighted average of the marginal contribution of each agent. And in our case, an agent is an exact feature, like age or capital gains. So how much does the adding or removing that feature affect a single prediction? 
Um, so these are some of the visualizations that SHAP includes in their library, which is really nice. Um, gives a, a good instinct for you know, which features are pushing up a, uh, a prediction and which features are dragging it down, um, along with more global attributions for across all my data points, how are the attributions distributed amongst all my features. Um, and as I said, you know, attributions work beyond just simple uh, tabular data, but also on images. And uh, as on images, you can imagine it as kind of like a heat map um, over an image to see which, which pixels were the most important and which pixels were not important at all. Um, and um, SHAP is easy to use. You import it after you've installed it. You create this explainer by passing it a model and some data points. Um, basically, those data points um, ground it in terms of what an um, average prediction looks like, what a baseline prediction is, to understand how each prediction that, that you're querying differs from you know, an average prediction. Um, and then you ask for a specific example, or in this case, set of examples, give me back my feature attributions. All right, so this is the link um, that everyone with a laptop should go to um, so we can start playing live. Um, so at this, um, at this URL is the, the entire tutorial info page, which includes a link on it to say, like, click here to open the tutorial notebook. And then you'll be launched into a Colab notebook um, for this exercise. If you haven't used Colab before, it's a nice interactive um, web-based UI for running Python code um, up in the cloud. Uh, it doesn't require you to install anything or do anything beyond open the tab and log into a Google account, either like a Gmail or a G Suite account, to use it. Um, so we prefer it over um, Jupyter Labs because there's Jupyter uh, notebooks just because there's nothing you have to install on your laptop. You can just go to the web page and start playing with it. Um, so I'll leave this up here for a little longer and kind of um, intro what exactly we're going to look at. Um, we're not going to use UCI Census because that data is, um, I mean, it's a real toy problem, right? Um, it doesn't really gain us any real insight about the world. Um, a, oh, okay. <laughs> a, uh, uh, the data set we're going to use is the Compass data set. Is anyone familiar with Compass? Just a few hands. Um, so the Compass data set, oh, even there more hands. There we go. Yeah. Uh, anyway, so this is a data set. Um, Compass is this pretrial um, risk model um, that's used by, by um, some jurisdictions in the American justice system to decide the likelihood of someone reoffending, um, called recidivism. Um, so it's often used to set bail requirements or possibly um, used to uh, even during sentencing. Um, and we'll see why this is a terrible idea uh, as we do our, our exercise. Um, so it's a, basically a data set of, of people. Uh, this, was, um, this data set was created um, for a ProPublica article, um, which there's a link to in the Colab notebook, where they um, basically, uh, on a set of 10,000 or 15,000 um, from Broward County in Florida, um, got the Compass scores um, from those individuals and their demographic information that was passed into the model. Um, and this is a proprietary model by this, by this private company that, that releases this to, um, to jurisdictions. And it makes a prediction, um, we simplified a bit, to if they're high risk or low risk. Um, and ProPublica went and took those 10 or so thousand people and actually looked through their criminal records to see if they did reoffend within two years to try and look at how accurate is the model at actually predicting recidivism um, to look for any potential sources of bias and issues with the model itself. Um, you could also um, make a claim about if it's an appropriate case of machine learning itself. But what they're looking at there is also, in terms of the model that's been deployed, is it treating different groups equitably? Um, and we're going to basically use um, this Colab notebook, which then downloads the data, trains a model, um, a simple prediction model for high versus low, um, um, basically, risk, based on the, model, the, the, the labels that Compass returned itself. So we're trying to mimic the Compass model, which is proprietary, but build our own version of it that, that mimics it. And then we use the what-if tool to um, display those results against if they actually reoffended or not, to see how well our proxy model for Compass does in terms of uh, all the different demographic groups. Um, and we'll also, in this notebook, um, add in Shapley values to that, so that in addition to just visualizing, oh, how did the model predict for this specific person, we'll also show what did the model use to make that prediction, which will help uh, gain some insight here. Um, so is everyone that wants to go to that site have it already? Um, and, um, and don't be shy, and if you don't have your laptop with you, or if your laptop is low on battery charge and you want to participate, like feel free to sit next to someone, make a new friend, um, and if need be, uh, I can pull up my laptop as well and we can do the exercise together. So Yeah, because this will be, um, as, we, as we move through this, we'll want to um, spend some time with those with laptops, kind of looking through the data and poking and prodding to see what we can find. So it's good to gather around someone else with a laptop to kind of join in that conversation. 
Um, and also, uh, let's see. So we're at 20 till the end of the session. Yeah, is it that goes correct? to 615. 615. Yep. Ah, so we are 35 till the end of the session. So maybe uh, 20 minutes. Yep. Let me, I'll just uh, I'm gonna go over the code cells okay, and then cool. we'll do it. Yep. Mm -hmm. That sounds great. Um, so in terms of running a Colab notebook, um, all you actually have to do, since we filled out all the code that's necessary to run this, is go to the runtime and click run all. And then everything is going to run, and at the bottom, the what if tool is going to magically appear after a minute or so, a few minutes. Um, but I will briefly go over what these different cells are doing um, so you can kind of follow along with, with what we did in this uh, specific notebook. Um, we're installing the what if tool and the SHAP libraries because they don't come pre-installed in, in Colab inst instances. Um, then we're downloading the data set of um, this Compass data set that's been open sourced. Um, and then we're pre-processing the data a little bit to remove some rows that don't have enough data for us to, to actually predict on. Um, we're renaming a column to make it easier to read. Um, and then we're, we're doing the simple compass determination of like high versus low, as opposed to what compass initially returns, which is like a, a score between zero and 10, just to simplify the problem for analysis. Um, and then we're listing our input features here. Um, and then creating a, a pandas data frame with all this information in it um, so that we can kind of feed it to a model. Um, then we're splitting our data into test and train sets. So we have 80% of the data that we're going to test train on and 20% that we'll hold out to use with the what if tool. Um, and then the next one right here is building a Keras model, a really simple, small neural network to do this problem. Um, and then training it in like a number of seconds. It's a very small model, not a lot of data. It trains, you know, just like that. Um, then we're importing the SHAP library and setting it up, basically giving it a set of baseline values so it can compare individual data points against like a consort, a consort of, of what a, a, an average prediction looks like. Um, and then we're bringing up the what if tool. Um, so this is the, 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 the work that needs to, uh, to create the what if tool for this data set. Since this is a Keras model um, and not like a TensorFlow model, um, we, we have to define our own little simple custom prediction function, which takes in examples and just calls like model.predict. Um, it also then calls uh, the Shapley explainer on it and packages those results along with it as well, um, just so we can do a little more analysis here. Um, if you didn't care to have Shapley values and just wanted to do prediction and, and explore it, the, the custom prediction function would just be a few lines of code. Um, and then we're dropped into immediately um, our what if tool in this case um, with the compass data set and the Shapley values. Um, and if, if the, the default height for the tool doesn't fit well on your laptop screen, you can change this value. Um, to whatever amount of pixels will make it fit well uh, on your screen. Because um, we're a single model here, we don't have a, a diagonal to look off of. There's just once points towards the top are more likely to be um, high risk, and, and towards the bottom are more likely to be low risk. Um, and now, since we have attribution values, one thing we benefit, we gain now, is the ability that the, um, the features are sorted by the ones that had the, the highest value in pushing a prediction up, and the ones at the bottom are the ones that had the um, push the predictions most down. And you can see these exact attribution numbers right next to them. And then we have a, a color scale as well. So we can see in this case, um, age is pushing this prediction to be more high risk. Um, and this is because if you look at this model, it's saying that low, low age is actually a, a predictor for, uh, for high risk of, of uh, reoffending. Just to understand what the SHAP uh, library is doing, mm -hmm. we, we chose just five data points as our baseline? Oh, no. Um, that was just to test out that the SHAP library is working here. OK. Uh, here in the, um, the 200. Uh, we, we take 200 examples to create our like, baseline. But you, you could pass them all in there as well. Yes, because it means that if I pick up the wrong baseline, yep. I will get the wrong con conclusions, right? Yep, so and that's one uh, pretty big. Um, caveat on using SHAP is that just like any attribution method, it depends on a baseline. And if your baseline is not representative, um, then the explanations themselves won't have much meaning. In this case, yeah, we're just using a small amount. Um, so we can, you can always um, just take out our subset of 200 and use the entire array so that the baseline is taken from the entire test set or train set. Or you can even pass in uh, train data dot values to have the baseline be the entirety of the training data as well. Um, that might provide a, a more accurate look at things. It's true. And would you suggest to use train data instead of the test data? It's a great question. I don't actually know. Does anyone here have any intuition into um, what makes a good SHAP deep explainer baseline in terms of test versus train data? Because um, it's interesting because you're, you're, you're analyzing based off of test data. So you might get a baseline that's based off the point you're trying to predict that you're trying to get SHAP values from versus um, getting ones that were actually used to train the model. I'm not sure off the top of my head which would be more appropriate. I guess you would have to measure the distribution distance between the your train and test split. And if they, it's, if they are close, it won't, it won't matter, matter much. much. Yep, 
So I guess it'd be interesting to look at that, yep. Um, so yeah, um, so anyway, um, down below the uh, notebook, there's a set of exploration ideas um, for things you might wanna try doing with the tool. Um, in this case, to see if there's any interesting insights you can find out about how this model performs. Uh, does it have a specific bias? Um, if so, what type of bias? Um, certainly, um, I mean, if you've read the ProPublic article linked to it, um, the main reason that this was published and, and talked about is, is due to a, a heavy bias against African Americans, where it's uh, much more likely to, um, to predict high risk for African Americans and have uh, a lot of false positives, um, versus Caucasians, where it has uh, much lower average risk scores and many more false negatives. Um, and we can see, if you use the what-if tool, you can try and um, see if you can recreate that exact analysis by poking around, um, and then also taking a look at um, anything else and seeing if there's anything interesting you can find, and then we'll, so we'll take about, uh, should we take 15 minutes on that? And then, uh, then we'll have like a little report back on that, um, and then we can talk about next steps as well. And feel free to ask questions and we'll come around. <laughs> 